Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gail Prudenti, and I am the proud dean of the Maurice A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra University. When recently asked at a business luncheon what was his profession, our next speaker immediately responded, law professor. In fact, he joined Hofstra's law faculty in 1972, became a distinguished professor, and served as the law school's dean for more than a decade. With his decisive manner and master plan, he has made Hofstra a well-respected and nationally recognized university. He possesses a sharp wit and is also known as a scholar, gentleman, hands-on administrator, and true visionary. May I present the president of Hofstra University, Stuart Rabinowitz. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's a book I bought when I was appointed president, and it said, uh, that it says, How to Be a College President for Dummies. And uh, the first thing it suggests is that when anybody introduces you, you should try to choose somebody you just appointed to a very important <laughs> position. And Judge Prudente, with her kind words, has proved that axiom to be, to be true. I am delighted to welcome you to a very special event and that is to get to know and to listen to Justice Sotomayor, whose career, whose life uh, is an should be an inspiration for all of us to emulate. But first, I want to say uh, a couple of words about Dean Prudente. She is a distinguished jurist, was, happily, uh, in her own right. She served uh, in the New York State court system for more than two decades. She was the very first woman who ever presided over the appellate division second department. She served as the chief administrative judge of the entire court system of the state of New York. And she has in just a very, well, she's gonna be asking for more money, I think, but um, <laughs> in just a very few weeks, months, of her deanship, she has breathed energy and life and more national attention into this law school than I have seen in a very long time. Actually, the last time I saw that was when I became dean. <laughs> um, and as to um, Justice Sotomayor, before I get to the introductions, um, I just want to remind her that uh, we're so thrilled to welcome her back today because uh, she was at Hostra uh, at, in 2006 and spoke at our commencement, and I had the privilege of conferring an honorary degree upon her. And this true story, you know, I'm, I'm usually very conservative. I don't bet on a lot of different things, but I was reading to the crowd her background and her life story. And um, as I was about to hood her, I just said to myself, you know, she's gonna make a great Supreme Court justice one day. This was in 2006. She wasn't appointed in 2000 and, until 2009 to the court. So I called it, and ever since then, <laughs> I must tell you, ever since then, we have no problem getting circuit court judges to come and speak at our commencement. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna be brief in my introduction because uh, uh, the justice and I share the fact that we both grew up in the Bronx uh, in the shadow of Yankee Stadium. And uh, we both want this to be over so we can watch the game tonight. So uh, I'll be very brief. I will tell the justice I saw her at a game recently and she had the worst seats I've ever seen. So. Um, one of my law students, uh, uh, one of my graduates who was uh, my law student uh, is named Randy Levine, and he currently is the president of the Yankees, and so I can help the justice get better seats uh, <laughs> next time she comes. But um, Joseph Sotomayor is the first Latina and the third woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court. 
She was born in the Bronx, as I said. She earned her BA from Princeton University, graduating summa cum laude, which is the highest university one can receive. And then thereafter, she earned a JD degree from the Yale Law School, where she served as editor of the Yale Law Journal. After graduating from law school, she practiced law as an assistant district attorney in the New York County District Attorney's Office. She then went into private litigation for a number of years with the firm of Pavia and Harcourt. In 1991, President George H.W. Bush nominated her to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, where she served until 1998, in between I predicted this, that in, in um, 2009, uh, President Obama nominated uh, her as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. So without further delay, how about a warm welcome for both Dean Prudente and Justice Sotomayor. Mr. President didn't tell you what I told him when he said that to me. No, he did not. I told him, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> crazy as a fox. <laughs> Justice Sotomayor, let the record reflect how obviously overjoyed we are to have you with us today. And this is a heartfelt welcome to Hofstra. Thank you so much. As a brief overview of today's proceedings, I would like you to know that I will have a conversation with the justice for several moments. And next, the justice will take students' questions, which have been submitted during our lottery process, and then just followed by a brief conclusion. So my very first question, Justice Sotomayor, what time would you like to be home to watch tonight's important <laughs> Yankee game. No later than 8 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> As we know from sitting in this room and the proceedings here today, technology has made it possible to live stream this presentation, to live tweet one's remarks, and to post a podcast of one's remarks to the world instantly. Yet the Supreme Court continues to prohibit cameras during oral arguments, both video and by a regular camera. Do you ever think this prohibition will change or be relaxed? And also, what is your preference? Justice Studer, my predecessor, I, I came, I was his successor on the court once said that there would be cameras in the Supreme Court over his dead body. <laughs> That's how strongly he felt about the issue. Um, will it change? You can never say never. And so I could never, I, I'm not good at predicting that sort of thing. Um, and so I can't really prognosticate whether and how fast a change could come. Um, I can answer better my own personal preference. I didn't start out being as negative as I have become about cameras in the courtroom. Um, and it started during my confirmation process. As I, I met with 92 senators during my process. At the time, it was a record. And what I noticed was that um, they were always not in the Senate chamber. The Senate chamber was essentially empty. There was someone presiding. 
there were some functionaries, you know, whoever the secretary was, the people handling what was going on, um, and the senator who walked in to give a statement to an empty room and to a camera. And where was it being televised? On C-SPAN. Every other senator was in his or her office. And in not one room in which I met with the senator was the TV on showing what the other senator was saying. And as I talked to the senators about the changes of their interactions, every one of the senators who had been there for years, if not decades, attributed the major change in the collegiality among senators to the presence of TV cameras. That before that, they all had to be present to listen to each other talk. And it provided them with a physical space in which they would corner each other somewhere and actually hash out their conversations. It was a way for them to talk. And now with cameras, they don't talk to one another. They talk to a staffer who may be listening to what they're saying, who distills down whatever they're saying for their senator. And the staffer often knows what the senator is thinking or thinks they know what the senator is thinking. So you know that the distilling is not really there to change the person's mind. It's there to confirm whatever their attitude, or existing attitude is. So I left that experience and I thought, what would happen if they put a camera in the Supreme Court chambers? We're human beings like everybody else. People say, we will we'll forget it's there. How do you forget it's there when every night they'll be playing a clip of you or another justice asking a question? One of two things is going to happen. Some justices are going to ask a lot less questions, and some justices are going to ask a lot more questions. <laughs> Either way, it's not going to be the free exchange that we currently have. Because there's a, li there's a slightly lesser impact. When I say slightly lesser, I'm not talking about the font of knowledge. We give out or uh, audio tapes of our arguments that same night. So if you're interested, you can hear everything that's said in our chamber that evening. So it's not that you know less because there's no cameras in the courtroom, but what you will have more of is sound bites. When a justice is playing a devil's advocate, that's going to be the top news item that evening. And very few people are going to watch the exchange to see how that justice, a little bit later, asks the other side as difficult a question, if not more difficult a question. I'm worried about cameras changing the nature of our interactions with each other. And if I really thought that it was going to give you more information, then it might have some value. But sound bites are not information. Sound bites are used by people to create impressions that will move you in one way or another without enough thought and attention paid to the process. And so for me, i rather have the audio where people who are really interested listen and actually figure out what's being said throughout the tape rather than the TV sound bites. Thank you so much. I've also noticed that the number of Supreme Court decisions has remained approximately the same in recent years, about 80 cert grants and 70 decisions a year. Do you have a view on whether the Supreme Court should hear more cases, or do you feel comfortable with the number it currently decides every year? I'm comfortable with the number because that's the number. And it's not that we're trying to avoid taking cases. Um, a lot of what drives cert grants are new laws. And we haven't had a lot of new laws for a long time. <laughs> and, and, and this is in earnest. 
a lot of cases are driven by the uncertainty of law in new areas. And so after any major uh, change in law, like healthcare, we got a slew of cases, and that particular term and the term after, we had an uptick of cert petition grants. Since most of those major issues were resolved, we're back to a norm that seems to fit within the number of laws there are and how many real splits there are. And as you may know, a lot of cases come to us with two or three embedded questions, not just one. And a lot of the embedded questions themselves are still being worked out in the lower courts. And so we don't want to grant a cert on a case that's not ready for our consideration. And so we might bypass another question in that same case until the earlier issue is resolved. And sometimes it's based on a factual distinction that really won't help elucidate the law in a meaningful way for the larger practice of law. So there's a lot of reasons we may not take a case. It's rarely because we don't feel like we want to do more work. Um, we certainly, you know, work expands to fill the available time. We work to fill the available time, and, the, and people work for us to fill the available time. The number of amici briefs, the number of people writing about our case, cases. For some cases, I think in one of our cases on same-sex marriage, um, one of my colleagues added up the number of amici brief and briefing, and it was over 10,000 pages. And considering that we only have two weeks between sittings to get through what people are giving us, that's a lot of reading in one case. It certainly is. Well, I have a number of other questions that I would like to ask you, but I know there is a number of students in this audience who cannot wait uh, to <laughs> hear what you have to say and really are looking forward to your insights. Now, Gail, you know that I hate sitting still. <laughs> I do. All I right. do. And the audience may not know this, but I like walking around. <laughs> it helps me think better. It helps me to see the audience better. I can barely see the faces of the people back there from here. So I want to walk around. There's only one little problem. There's all of these people around the room with these little things in their ears. <laughs> They're U.S. Marshals. <laughs> They're here to protect me from me. They don't like me walking around. They really don't like me walking around, but I do it anyway. <laughs> um, but if people get up unexpectedly, it scares them. And they have been given permission by the powers to be that if they're scared, they pull me out. I don't want to be pulled out. So if you stay seated, this will work. How's that? All right? Unless I'm going to talk to you and I ask you to get up, and then they're OK. So, Gail, you get to pick the students, so. Okay, it's my understanding that we have a number of students in the audience that uh, are ready to ask questions. Are we ready? Tell me which way to go. All right, there we go. All right. Good evening, Justice. Um, my name is Danielle Levy, and I'm a second year student here at Hofstra, and I just want to thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. I recently read an interview that you gave where you tell the story of receiving a C on your first paper at Princeton. For the next three years, you vigorously worked to improve your writing and challenge yourself. And as a result, you graduated summa cum laude and went on to Yale Law School. You talked about not letting failure stop you, even though it may hurt. So I would love to hear more about what personally keeps you going when things get difficult. Your strength is definitely an inspiration to us all as we persevere here at law school at Hofstra. <sighs> <laughs> that, that's such a big question. <laughs> you know, because what keeps you going changes over time. And, um, but I guess there's one constant. Friends keep me going. Um, but it took until my learning that I had to share with my friends what I was feeling. And that took me a very, very long time to realize. Um, partly cultural. Uh, my family were not talkers about emotion. And so I wasn't either. 
Some of it was my own stubbornness. I was pretty independent and didn't think I really needed help with anything or really want help with my emotions. I was good about asking for help like I did when I got my C from professors and teachers to teach me skills. But learning how to deal with your own emotional health is not a skill that I thought that anybody could help me with. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> and I think we're all wrong uh, when we feel that way. And what I learned, but it took me until I was much older in life, that no one does it alone. That you have to rely on friends, not just to listen, but to help guide you in figuring out a better way to perceive and feel things. And that's what my friends have done for me in this sort of latter half of my life. They've been the force that have kept me from going crazy, you know. Um, earlier, with another group of students, I told the story of during my Supreme Court nomination, feeling so overwhelmed by all the negative things I heard people saying about me. There were people who were saying I wasn't smart enough, that I would never be a great justice, that I was just mediocre. They began to get to me. And I began to feel like I was giving up a fine reputation as a court of appeals judge for a position that would become tainted with all the negative criticisms of me. And it took a friend who um, learned about my decision, who basically said to me, what are you, crazy? This is not about you. This is about you reaching a position that's important for other people to look up to, to have hope about my daughter and other little girls looking there and saying, I can do that too. So she made me sort of step out of my self-pity and look at this in a different lens. And that was enough of a lens to sort of motivate me to keep going. It didn't take away my insecurity. It didn't help me deal with that sense of, what am I gonna do now with this big job? And that took more sort of working it through and doing what I'd always done, which is working hard and trying to make a difference in the only way I know how which is to think and write so that I can explain to people what the meaning is of what the law is doing. And since then, there's been some reception for some of my ideas, and I feel maybe not as smart as some of my colleagues, but smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's always the problem, which is we want to be better, but just not good enough but good enough is good enough. And you can do a lot with good enough. You know? So for me, I think those are the things that have kept me going. Who's next? And you can come, come get up again. Hold on, I just lost sight of where you were. And where is my lovely photographer? He was supposed to be at my side. <laughs> come on out. You want to take that off because okay. you won't like it in the picture. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to you. Gail, he said he would be by my side, you know? <laughs> Hello, you guys. All right. Okay. I'm going to come around this way. Hi, Justice Sotomayor. Um, my name is Elizabeth Barrison, and I am a first-year law student. Ah, the scariest time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's when you feel really dumb, isn't it? <laughs> um, I personally would just like to thank you for taking the time to come talk to us today. Um, while the justices of the Supreme Court do not always agree, they still have a great amount of respect for one another. What do you think is the best route to engaging in discourse while maintaining respect for a person of differing views? Um, I can't say that I had this insight. It was <laughs> taught to me by Justice Souter. Um, Justice Souter called me uh, the first day I was at the court to welcome me to the court. Um, and he had a short conversation with me, but said to me, Sonia, 
I began to enjoy my work and to be less frazzled about it, less tormented by it. When I realized that when people disagreed with me, A, it wasn't personal, but B, it was because they were people of goodwill who had a different opinion than I did. And once I understood that, it was easier to live with our differences for me. And I found very shortly after getting to the court, hearing his words in the back of my head, that he was absolutely right. My colleagues, every one of them, is as passionate as I am about the work we do. We all love the country. There isn't one justice, and I disagree fiercely with some of them, <laughs> but there isn't one justice who doesn't love the United States of America, our Constitution, our system of justice any less than I do. And in fact, that passion drives some of the fiery dissents that we throw at one another. You know, you can't get angry unless it's because you feel hurt by something. And that hurt is, God, why can't I shake you and make you see my side? <laughs> All right? That, someone's disagreeing with you. That's what you want to do. You keep thinking, what is it that they're not seeing? Why are they blind? Why are they not understanding? And that drives some of the writing that goes back and forth between and among the justices. But in the end, you can respect each other if you understand that that's what's firing the dispute. And in fact, the most fiery dissents are because the person lost. And that's what keeps the majority writer sort of calm most of the time, because they won. <laughs> um, but that exchange, I think, is what makes us be so collegial with one another. You know, there are views that people have that you can feel offended by. There are views surrounding sensitive issues like racism, where people can feel very personally attacked. But in most instances, a lot of expressed views are born of fears, of people's insecurity about what things mean to them and how they're affecting them. And if you can appreciate that, even though you might disagree with how it's being expressed, you can have a more open mind about understanding what's motivating people. And I give an example openly, immigration, a highly contentious issue in our society today. I'm often asked what my position is, and my response is always, this is not my issue as a justice. This is our issue as a society, as a part of America. We have to come to an answer, and we have to talk about it, but we have to understand what's motivating the fears. And we have to deal with them, and we have to talk about them, and we have to find ways to make people feel more secure in that conversation. And so it's like every issue, though. A lot of it's born from fear. And if you can respect that, you can talk more. Now he's ahead of me, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. You know, the world has changed so much. When I was a law student, I dressed in jeans for three years. <laughs> I don't think there was any speaker that I would have dressed up for. And every student in this auditorium is dressed up. You guys really impressed me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, who's next? Who has, ah, oh, this is really good. <laughs> Hello. Oh, I like it. That makes me, I've been sitting too much today. Hello. How are you? Good evening, Justice. My name is Taryn Zamuda, and I'm also a first year law student. Um, I just want to say that it's been amazing to hear from a woman that I admire so much. So thank you for being here. Thank you. 
Um, starting out in the DA's office, uh, working for the Second Circuit and now the Supreme Court, um, must have really been challenging and quite the journey. What advice or wisdom can you give to law students and those of us starting out in the legal workforce? And how did you remain so strong and resilient in tough times throughout your career? Oh, I don't know if I've been tough and resilient all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I've had my moments where I haven't been. Um, the journey in life is filled with fear. Why? Because any time you step out of your comfort zone to do something new, whatever it is, whether it's going to leaving your grammar school, going to middle school, going on to high school, college, if you can access your feelings from that time, what emotion you f probably felt was bittersweetness. The bitterness of leaving friends that were familiar, of an environment that you knew probably inside out, and the pride, the sweetness of graduating. I made it. Um, but then the fear, the fear of going to high school and not knowing what that would be like. Would you find friends? Can you manage the studies? Well, that emotion follows you from high school to college, from college to law school, to every new job. That bittersweetness and that sort of gut feeling of, am I going to make it? It's always a question. It's always an issue. I've often said, if you're so conceited that you don't have a little bit of fear, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and if there's something wrong with you, maybe you should go take care of it right away. <laughs> um, but understanding that emotion, sort of dealing with the knowledge that, yes, it won't be easy. It's going to be something new, and as a result, something hard to manage and understand and cope with is what can help you get through it. Um, it is understanding that fear should motivate you to take more chances. Because with every chance you take, the greater success you can have. You know, I ask kids sometimes, What's better, trying something and failing, or trying something and never experiencing the joy of succeeding? I know where my bet is. Because you see, not trying something and failing, it's momentary pain. And if you try again, and you figure out from that experience what you did wrong, and what you have to work on to improve your chances the next time, you still have a shot of succeeding. But I never wanted at the end of my life to put my head down and say, I walked away. I've done that only once in my life, and that was at Harvard when I interviewed at Harvard. I tell the story in my book. I walked into a scene like something I've never seen. Uh, Harvard is very collegial, those old you know, medieval building looking things. And I walk into this office that is in, has an oriental red rug, really beautiful, really real. A, two white couches. I had never seen white couch, couches in anybody's house that I knew. And certainly never couches without plastic covering. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this woman there who's in a black dress, older woman older than me, obviously. And she had perfectly coffered hair, real pearls and earrings. If you ask me how I knew they were real, they shine. <laughs> all right? And all of a sudden, I hear this yapping at my feet. And there are these two black and white poodles. And I'm looking at this scene. I'm all of 18 years old. I don't think I'm 18 yet, because this would have been my senior year, so I was 17 still. And I just froze up. 
I've never had an interview where I didn't know how to talk to this woman. She was so different than the world I came from. So different from anything I had ever imagined. I literally froze up. Shortest interview I ever had, 10 minutes, I fled the office. I went outside to her assistant and looked at her assistant and said, there are students who are supposed to meet me and show me the campus. Please tell them I had an emergency come up. And I literally fled back to the subway station and took the subway back to New York. <coughs> when I went home and knocked at the door, my mother looked at me and said, you were supposed to stay there overnight. And my response was, mommy, I don't belong there. It is the only moment of my life where I've actually completely fled. Do I regret it? Well, I got into Princeton. It was a good constellation. <laughs> I also got into Radcliffe at the time. I don't know how, but I got in. But my point is that I still remember the fear that drove me and how embarrassed I was about me. And it wasn't the feeling that I wanted to live with the rest of my life. And so I have tried hard since then not to let fear control my choices. And that's what I hope all of you will do, not let fear control or limit your choices. Try. Soar like a bird, just fly as far as you can. It really does bring you joy just in the trying. All right, who's next? Oh, I don't have to walk so far, okay. Uh, good evening, Justice Sotomayor. My name is Henderson Hui Hui, and I am a 1L here at Hofstra. And I would like to say I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to ask you a question this evening. And my question for you is, given that the circumstances of your upbringing did not give you an advantage in pursuing a career in law, what would be your advice to a 1L student who also did not have an upbringing that prepared for a career in law? Hmm. It's actually a good question, and no young lawyer has asked me that. I, take off your, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, first, it is important for you to recognize your ignorance. Now, there's a big difference between the word ignorant and the word stupid. But people often confuse the meaning of those two words. Stupid is a lack of capacity to understand. Ignorance is a lack of exposure to know. And so most of us are ignorant about things we don't know. But lots of us are ashamed of admitting ignorance because it thinks we confuse it with stupidity. If we ask a question that's silly to him, we think we're stupid. Well, it's not silliness, and it's not stupid. It is ignorant when you don't know something, and very, very smart when you know to ask. And that's one of the things that I didn't, certainly didn't do enough of. I fell into a lot of right things when I got to college and law school, but if I had been as well-educated then as I am now, I would have known to seek out help earlier. I would have known to look not for the classmates who were like me, because they made me feel more comfortable. I would have known when I was in law school to find all those smarty pants in the room <laughs> and make them a part of my study group. Because if I had gone into a study group, not just with my friends, but with people who I perceived as smarter than me, I probably would have learned how to think like a lawyer faster. I would have accessed professors and asked them what the measures of success were at law school. I stumbled into some of them, 
But I wrote my journal instead of in my second year, in my third year. Because it took me a while to understand that writing a note for a law journal was actually an important credential. And when I did, I found a topic and I did what I had to do and my note came out and it's helped me in the ways I expected it to. But unless you know what you have to do, you can't really follow a path of success. The same thing with clerking. I said no to law, to clerking for a judge. That was the only professional decision I've ever made that I've regretted. Because clerking is so valuable to every lawyer's experience in the law. Not only do you make a mentor for life in the judge you serve, but you learn what not just judging is about, but lawyering is about. What lawyers are actually trying to do, which is convince judges. And there are more effective ways of convincing judges than others. And you get to see that as a law clerk. And so I would have learned to ask. I would have learned to be more proactive to finding things out about how to belong more because feeling like you're an outsider is going to follow you for a very long time. You know, I still feel it. I'm very different than my colleagues. I come from a very different background. I enjoy a lot of things they don't. None of my colleagues, except Sandra Day O'Connor, love dance the way I do. They all love the opera. You think that's a small thing, but you know, it's being different. They like the opera, I like jazz. I come to settings that many of them don't visit. Um, when you feel different, you continue that your entire life. But finding a way to belong, even in being different, is I think the way you succeed in life. Because you can't give up being who you are. You don't want to give up being who you are. But you can be enough like the other side, to enjoy them. And then retreat and go have a Latin night somewhere. <laughs> Good luck to you. Thank you. I think we have time for just one more question. Oh, this seems too quick. <laughs> Hello, you guys. What are you, Pris? <laughs> Hi. Good evening, Justice Sotomayor. My name is Justin Manzi, and I'm also a first-year law come student. Around. Go ahead. Okay, I'm also a first-year law student. Thank you for your meaningful insight in response to tonight's questions. Um, tonight, you spoke at length about your own experiences and your background in uh, response to these questions. And my question is, do you believe that a judge's personal experiences should be a factor in judging cases? And if so, can a judge be truly impartial if these experiences affect his or her decision? Um, a few years back, um, there was a case involving a public school that was a no drug zone. And through four layers of hearsay, you're a law student, so you know, somebody told somebody who told somebody who told somebody who told somebody, who, told somebody, who finally told the principal okay, that this student was seen taking an aspirin. That was a drug, contrary to the school policy. And the school had someone strip search the young girl for the illegal drug. The parents of that student, this was a public school, sued the school for unreasonable search and seizure. And the issue that came before the court was, a, was there a cause of action for unreasonable search and seizure without reasonable cause or probable cause? During argument, now I wasn't there on the case, so I'm talking about something I read about, not something that I experienced. Um, I understand that a couple of male colleagues were asking questions of one of the lawyers analogizing that strip search to a young girl undressing in a locker room. And it was an analogy that offended many women because to be 
as my colleague Ruth Bader Ginsburg, colleague now, not then, said to a reporter after the argument, I don't think some of my colleagues know how sensitive a 13-year-old girl is about the integrity of her body and about her power to say yes or no to having someone touch it. And she's right. Do males have the same senses of sensitivity about that that boys do? I don't know. But I am a woman, and I know how horrifying it would have been for me at 13 to undress before an adult that I didn't give permission to have that adult touch me. It would have been life scarring. And so, did it make a decision, a difference in that decision? I doubt it. I don't think any judge voted because of that sensitivity. But I do know one thing that I can report, that no decision in that case publicly analogized being strip search to changing in a locker room. It would have been deeply offensive, hurtful and painful if some judge had put that in an opinion. But we had someone with a different life experience who stopped that from happening. And that is true of a lot of the decisions that we write whether it's the words you use, the analogies you make, the sentiments you convey, we as a collective group of justices help each other avoid unnecessary classifications, analogies, sentiments that are not necessary to the opinion or to its outcome, but that can inflict injury. Equally, how you explain someone's claim, recognizing its validity, even if not its legal recognition, is sometimes important. To be able to talk to someone who's losing and explain why they're losing, while still affirming the validity of their emotions, of their beliefs, of their sense of agreement, it's just as important as anything else. And that's what life experiences bring to the act of judging. That sense of wisdom of how you approach problems, how you listen and understand other people's reactions, how you listen enough to feel someone else's pain even if you've never experienced it. And those acts, because you're asking us to judge human, human situations. We're not judging the things that you read about on your law school papers. The things that we're judging have actually happened. And people have been hurt by what has actually happened. And so, for me, don't think you can take human experience away from the act of judging. It is interwined with the very act of judgment. You know, there was an analogy by one of my colleagues that judging was like baseball you call balls and strikes. Watch the game tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and whether a ball is on that line or not is a judgment call. And that's what you ask judges to do every day. It doesn't mean less bias if they're accessing their understanding of human nature, of human reaction from the experiences they've lived. As long as they're doing it, recognizing what they're doing, there's an awful lot of people who make judgments based on personal experiences that have no basis in reality. That's how we get a Plessy versus Ferguson. Who in the world today would think that you could have really separate but equal? But those judges did, and they were proven wrong very quickly. It just took us 50-odd years to get it right. But it was born of their life experiences. 
they were all white men who had lived in a world where, yeah, there were some poor people, but they had never lived in a black world. And they had no idea of how different the black world was and that it was never going to measure up to their sense of separate but equal. Um, those are the things that influence judging. Um, if what you're asking me is a different question, do judges let their personal experiences dictate results? No. You've got to pay attention to the law. You have to read precedent. You have to think about the statutory interpretation principles that you're applying, and do they make sense to come to the answer you're coming to. All of those things are a process of judging, but it includes understanding what's happening in the case. And you can't put aside life experiences from that, not in the way that you're thinking. Thank you, sir. All right, do I have to come back? Yes, please. All right. <laughs> I think I've been all around the room. You did have great. I? Yes, I think I have. Fabulous. It went faster than I thought. It really did. United States Supreme Court Justice. Sonia Sotomayor, thank you for being you. Ah, thank <laughs> you. not know, about a month ago, I went to a Yankee game and stood in Aaron Judge's chambers. <laughs> and the Yankees gave me a robe with a Yankee logo on the front and Aaron Judge's number 99 on the back. I don't think they knew, I'm sure they didn't know, that I am the 99th Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. <laughs> Um, I'm the 111th justice, but there were uh, 12 other chief judges and then me, or 13 now, 14 now. Um, my math is horrible <laughs> at any rate, because we're 114 justices now. At any rate, so this 99 fits, Perfect. and <laughs> I will wear the Hofstra shirt. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll even watch Perfect. the Yankees with it tonight. It's a wonderful <laughs> thing. It's a wonderful <laughs> thing. With great affection, appreciation, and Hofstra pride. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I love it. That concludes these proceedings, and I would just like to take the opportunity to thank each and every one of you with sharing with me what I'm sure you would agree was an inspirational experience. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.